Chapter 5, Bagging the Golden Goose. There are hundreds of motorcycle clubs throughout the country with members who follow the rules of the road and society, like all good citizens should. But in the playground of life, there will always be the misfits, loners, and bullies who choose not to play well with others. And when those bad boys band together and begin picking on the rest of us, or even each other, they fall under the state of California's definition of criminal street gang, which is to wit, a group of three or more persons whose activities include the commission of violent criminal acts, have a common name or identifying symbol, and whose members have engaged in a pattern of criminal gang activity. This description originally targeted the Hispanic and African American street gangs, like the Crips and Bloods, that were causing havoc throughout Southern California in the 1980s. Of the more than 120,000 gang members reported, in the cities across the United States during that time, over half were residing in Los Angeles County. By the mid-90s, there were over a thousand gang factions in the Los Angeles County area alone, and gang-related homicides accounted for nearly 40% of murders countywide. The California Street Terrorism Enforcement and Prevention Act step passed by the state legislature in response to that growing menace was eventually broadened to include one percenter clubs like the Vagos. Every outlaw biker in California can probably recite salient section of California Penal Code section 186.21 which reads, the state of California is in a state of crisis which has been caused by violent street gangs whose members threaten, terrorize, and commit a multitude of gang crimes against the peaceful citizens of their neighborhoods. These activities, both individually and collectively, present a clear and present danger to public order and safety and are not constitutionally protected. The STEPT Act particularly resonated with one percenters because it allowed judges to slap gang enhancement penalties on those found guilty of crimes committed while a gang member a felony conviction, for instance, might add from 2 to 10 years to a sentence depending on the crime's severity. In other words, if you were in a gang, 5 could get you 10. So was the Vagos MC a criminal street gang? According to the state of California, the answer was yes, as defined by the STEP Act. The group of three or more persons whose activities included the commission of violent criminal acts. Check had a common name or identifying symbol, check. Members engaged in a pattern of criminal gang activity, check, check, check. Every California law fears the STEP Act even more than the dreaded RICO. RICO is a federal statute originally used to prosecute organized crime. RICO is the most potent weapon in the federal arsenal and the statute that all one percenter gangs fear most. A successful RICO prosecution could potentially bring down an entire outlaw motorcycle club and lock away its key members for a long, long time. But the legacy of STEPT is evident everywhere within the California penal system. Thousands of gang members serve extended prison terms thanks to STEP, and a good number of them once rode outlaw. Of course, the one percenters will claim they're just a bunch of rough and tumble bike enthusiasts who love the freedom of the open road and the camaraderie of like-minded men. They'll bitch that step is just another example of how law enforcement tramples the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens. Bullshit. I was practically raised by one percenters, some I still consider family, and I can tell you there were only one reason they wore that one percent patch and declared themselves outlaws. Those boys took real pride in straddling their hairy edge of society and considered civilized behavior. And too often they stumbled and fell on the wrong side of the law because of that. It was a dangerous line to walk, but it came with the territory. It's what they signed up for. Of course, when an outlaw finds himself in court wearing ankle bracelets, he'll piss and moan about being picked on. He'll gripe that he was singled out and unfairly prosecuted by the man because of the patch on his back. It's hard to believe these people actually buy into their own hype. Law enforcement wouldn't waste time and resources on a bunch of Harley riding free spirits if they hadn't been committing crimes. Otherwise, 
every motorcycle club in America would be under siege by the government. No, law enforcement comes down hard on the patch because laws are being broke by the men who proudly wear it. With some of the most violent one percenter gangs in the country based on the west coast, including the Vagos, Mongols, and the Hells Angels, Southern California has always been ground zero in law enforcement's battle with America's outlaw culture. And the lawmen most experienced at targeting OMG's outlaw motorcycle gangs in that center of the world are those working at the Los Angeles Field Division of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives, a federal agency under the jurisdiction of the United States Department of Justice. For two decades now, a handful of ATF undercover specialists have been a constant thorn in the side of California outlaw bikers. Fact is, most of the largest OMG takedowns in United States history came as a direct result of that group's expertise. Every outlaw in the state is aware of those ATF boys and every outlaw club works constantly to keep those special agents and their hated CIs, confidential informants, from infiltrating the ranks of the Brotherhood. This tug of war between the 1% who refuse to compromise their lifestyle and the lawmen determined to hold them accountable has been waged since the end of World War II. That was when returning GIs who learn to ride and repair motorcycles in the service banded together on war surplus V-twins and rode off to have some fun. Over time, those bikers' reckless definition of fun had them butting heads with law enforcement. But then things got territorial and clubs began turning on each other like children fighting over the same sandbox. This roughhousing was tolerated to a point, but when the bullies stepped outside the box to brawl with the rest of us, law enforcement began smacking them down. For the ATF, this evolved into a marathon game of whack-a-mole. Every time the feds clobbered an outlaw on the head, another popped up. They simply wouldn't go away. The Los Angeles Field Division of the ATF has been whacking away at Green Nation and its international president, Terry the Tramp, since the late 1990s. In 1997, Darren Koz Kozlowski, one of the ATF undercover specialists out of Los Angeles, managed to infiltrate the Vagos Hollywood chapter posing as an outlaw. The agent's cover was soon blown and the operation folded, but two years later, the ATF went after the Vagos once again, this time using a confidential informant named Hammer. Hammer was a full-patch Vagos and known narcotics trafficker doing time on a parole violation. With only a handful of months to go before his release, he was ordered to do an inside job for the Nazi lowriders, a white supremacist prison gang. Hammer declined the job, which pissed off the lowriders and put his life in jeopardy. Hammer was desperate to get out from behind the walls, and his parole officer put him in touch with ATF. In exchange for a get out of jail free card, Hammer agreed to inform on the Vogels, going under with his own chapter in Pasadena. Operation Green Nation folded prematurely but resulted in the arrest of dozens of Vogels members on firearms and narcotics charges. Mission accomplished. ATF relocated Hammer to Utah, where he was later found drowned in a jacuzzi, done in by a drug overdose. Since that time, no special agent or CI had been able to penetrate the Vogels membership. And for good reason. Tired of cops and rats sneaking in the back door, Terry the Tramp and his nervous minions squeezed their butt cheeks tight. The sheriff from Riverside understood this which was why he was dangling money and motorcycles before me like carrots on a stick. That lawman knew damn well that any stranger who tried budding up to the Vagos now would make those assholes pucker. But George Rowe was a different story. I was no stranger. Both the chapter president and his second in command had tried recruiting me into the club. The Hemet Vagos wanted me on their team. All I had to do was walk through the door and announce, here I am boys, I'm all yours. But that wasn't going to happen, at least not with the sheriff as my partner. I'd survived 42 years on pure instinct, and there was just something about that lawman that set five alarm bells ringing. So when I called Detective Duffy the next morning and told him I might be willing to hook up with the Vagos, the offer came with a caveat. I put my ass on the line, but not for his task force, buddy. At first, Kevin tried changing my tune. The Special Investigations Unit had the experience. 
his man could be trusted. But my mind wouldn't be changed. And when the detective realized that, he stopped trying. All right, you go with your gut, Kevin said at last, and I'll see what I can do. I'd be lying if I said there were no second thoughts as I waited for Kevin Duffy's return call. Matters weren't helped by the sheriff who kept hounding me on that throwaway phone. He was hot for an inside man. I just wanted him out of my life, so I blew up the call minutes and tossed that phone in the nightstand drawer. Within a few days, Kevin called back with news. He found someone he thought I could work with, an ATF agent working out of the Bureau's Los Angeles field office. Because Kevin didn't trust his brothers in blue, he suggested another meeting at the dump off Warren Road. As an alternative, I suggested a daylight rendezvous in B Canyon, a remote area of dirt trails and scrub brush 10 minutes from the apartment, which I knew like the back of my hand. Heading into the parched foothills east of Via Vista, where nothing much lived but snakes and buzzards, I passed the ranger station and turned up B Canyon truck trail. Not long after I pulled off the road and parked in that empty place, a silver Ford Expedition came lurching up the dirt track and pulled up behind me. I stepped from the cab and started toward the cowboy style, cigarette dangling from my lips and a 380 revolver tucked into an open shoulder holster. I wasn't supposed to be carrying a firearm, I was a convicted felon, but I figured I was one of the boys now and could get away with it. Kevin Duffy popped the passenger seat snapping, hide that thing. Guess I figured wrong. He gestured for me to take his place up front and I did as ordered while he climbed in back. I slipped into the seat and nodded to the man behind the wheel. My first impression of agent John Carr was that he looked like he belonged on a surfboard off Redondo Beach. Carr was in his late 30s with a muscular build, slightly Asian features and jet black shoulder length hair. During his time undercover with the Mongols MC, the members gave him the road name Hollywood. The ATF agent who would become a partner and confidant through my three grueling years as a federal informant was a former athlete who loved the camaraderie of the team and the thrill of 80s crime dramas like Miami Vice. He found both in law enforcement where he discovered an affinity for undercover work. Only a week after graduating the academy, Carr was out in the field buying illicit machine guns. It would have been a short-lived career, except the weapons dealer, sniffing them all, executed the wrong man. Back in the day, I'd get high on coke and meth. John Carr got high on the action. By the time we met in the wilds of B Canyon, he'd worked over 200 drug and weapons cases, infiltrated the Mongols, handled scores of undercover agents and informants, including Cos and Hammer, and been involved in some of the biggest motorcycle gang takedowns in United States history. Within law enforcement circles, Special Agent Carr was one of the true rock stars. Kevin Duffy had heard of John Carr through a sheriff's deputy working with the One Percenter Task Force, a group Carr had formed with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department two years earlier. Now, here was the ATF special agent sitting next to me, sizing me up, curious to know if I'd make a legitimate candidate for undercover work. Right away, Kevin wanted assurances I'd be safe in government hands. To his credit, Carr didn't bullshit him. Detective, if we go forward with this, said the agent, my only guarantee is that I'll have your man's back for as long as he's under. Then he turned to me and said, fair enough? Fair enough, I answered. Agent Carr was a straight shooter. I hadn't known what to expect, but I liked the man immediately. He asked about my background, my expertise with the one percenters, and whether I'd ridden with any biker gangs, which I hadn't. But you do ride, he asked. Pretty much all my life, I told him. My old man bought me a scrambler when I was a kid, but I couldn't reach the brake pedal. So the only way to stop was by jumping off the fucking thing. Carr grinned. What are you riding now? I sheepishly glanced at Kevin, who answered for me. George doesn't even own a motorcycle at the moment, he said. Sad, but unfortunately true. And I was still kicking myself for selling that beautiful machine. I custom built a Harley Shovelhead old school. She had a big 106 inch motor, drag bars, raked frame, suicide shifter, and oh yeah, fuck the turn signals. Man, I love that chopper, but I needed quick cash to finance a new and expensive hobby, gambling. 
That's right, old George had swapped one addiction for another. A personality like mine, walking the straight and narrow, was a never-ending struggle. For every two steps forward, there was an inevitable step back, and gambling was a monster one. A few months before our meeting in B Canyon, I'd sold that shovel head for chump change to a dentist who rode with another motorcycle club in Hemet, called the Bros. That Harley was worth twice what Doc paid for it. I just couldn't ride with the Vagos. No bike, huh? I can see how that might be a problem, said Carr, straight faced. Funny thing about bikers, they ride bikes. The fucker had a sense of humor, too. Tell you what, though, he continued. If we go forward and you get in, that's a pretty big if. We'll find you a bike. I'll get in, I assured him. It's possible, replied Carr. You seem like a likable guy. You're outgoing. You've got a look that fits. And Detective Duffy tells me you know the Vogels and Hemi. That's not a small thing. But the chapters are being cautious right now. The Vogels got burned not too long ago. I know because I was one of the guys that burned them. Carr was talking about Operation Green Nation. Even before Hammer OD in that Utah jacuzzi, Green Nation's border had been on lockdown. Joining the Vogels now was like being screened through cheesecloth. Fortunately for me, that wasn't the case in Hemi. Big Roy wanted to lead the biggest, baddest outlaw chapter in all the land. One that would grab the attention of Terry the Tramp up in Hesperia. And he was on an aggressive recruiting drive to make it happen. Like the English press gangs of old. They'd even muscled members away from Bro's MC, including Doc, who owned my old chopper. I'll get in, I repeated confidently. Let me ask you something, said Carr. What exactly are you looking to get out of this, George? There was no hesitation. I want to catch whoever did David and get those assholes off the street. And that's all. Isn't that enough, I said. People in Hammond are afraid, okay? I'm just trying to do what's right. Carr swallowed a smile. I knew how I sounded. Like an idealistic Eagle Scout taking a break from escorting two old ladies across the street. Thing is, I meant every word. Carr was understandably skeptical. George, people always want something. Look, this isn't about money if that's what you're thinking, I said heatedly. You just asked me what I wanted and I told you. That's it. End of story. But Carr still couldn't wrap his head around it. An agent drew a paycheck while undercover. An informant worked off his case and stayed out of prison. Me, the man with nothing to gain and everything to lose, was asking for nothing and risking everything. In his 12 years with the Bureau, Special Agent Carr had pretty much seen and heard it all. But this was a new one for both an agent and an agency with a storied history of busting motorcycle outlaws. No private citizen had ever volunteered for such an assignment, let alone risk their neck without reward. Sometime later, while recalling our first meeting, John Carr said he thought I had to be naive. Full of shit or just plain crazy? Maybe all three. There would be times when I thought so myself. All right, George, he said at last. You start hanging around with the Vogels and we'll see where it takes us. If it looks like you can get in and if you're still willing to do this thing, I'll pull the paperwork together and make it official. That work for you works for me. He extended his hand and I clasped it firmly. You know, there is one thing I said quickly. Carr's jaw tightened. I knew he had to be thinking, here it comes. When this is all over, I said, I want five minutes alone in the cell with Todd and Roy. That's all I ask. Five minutes to teach those bitches a lesson. I can't promise that, said Carr matter-of-factly. But if we get to that point, I'll see what I can do. In hindsight, I realized John Carr must have known the shitstorm I was headed for. He'd sailed that way countless times with others. Of course, blaming anyone but myself for what followed would be like suing Marlboro for shoving those coffin nails in my mouth. Truth was, it was my decision, and mine alone, to go under. Special Agent Carr was never anything but straight with me. Moreover, the man was doing his job. The day I fell into Carl's lap was the day the feds bagged their golden goose. Someone with the right connections and no suspicious background or agenda. Someone who could slip easily into the brotherhood of tight-knit one percenters and bust them from the inside. The ATF would have been fools not to cash in. On the drive home from B Canyon, the enormity of the task ahead started tap-tap-tapping in my mind. 
I held a brief conversation with the man in the rearview mirror. It wasn't something like, what the fuck, George? What kind of crazy shit are you getting yourself into? It's true I hadn't yet signed on the dotted line, but paperwork was just a formality. I pushed my chips all in, a commitment that had my guts twisted into a double clove hitch. Had I another half ounce of brains, I would have kept driving to the I-215, made a run to Lax, and caught the next flight to Peru. But bailing on the vow I made to God, myself and the people of Hemet was unthinkable now. I'd been many things in life. A quitter had never been one of them. Anyway, if I was going to do this thing, the timing would never be as good. I had no wife, girlfriend, or family to place in harm's way. My old man was long gone. My mother had died a few years earlier, and both sisters had moved on. My adoptive family had washed their hands of me following the infamous midget affair. Yes, I had a son out of wedlock, but he was with his mom, and I seldom saw him. I was free and clear to infiltrate the Vagos. The only sticking point was old Joe. Old Joe was my best buddy and trusted partner in family tree service, my Hammett landscaping and tree trimming business. If I was headed somewhere, chances were old Joe was riding shotgun in the truck. During the 15 years I'd known the man, we'd formed a kinship, tight as blood. Didn't start out that way though. When I first laid eyes on Joe, I thought he had to be the dumbest son of a bitch I ever saw. With a long, gangling body, a slow way of talking, and a nose so big it arrived before he did. Only my friend wasn't stupid, far from it. Old Joe had once been a supervisor for a big medical equipment firm up in Orange County, where he'd shared a white collar home with his wife and two kids. Hell, the man even coached Pop Warner football. But then his wife divorced him and took their youngest with her. And when the older boy moved in with his girlfriend, my buddy was left all by his lonesome in that big empty house. Joe's father was a Methodist minister who'd married the church organist and retired to Hemet in the early 80s. After the preacher died and his wife suffered a paralyzing stroke a few weeks later, Joe played the dutiful son and moved down to Hemet to care for him. Unfortunately, his mom was gone within a year. Alone again with his career over and too much time and money on his hands, old Joe started abusing methamphetamine. I know this for a fact because I was his supplier back in the bad old days. Meth beat up Joe pretty good. In his gentle, soft-spoken way, my friend would be the first to tell you he wasn't the most handsome son of a bitch on the planet. But tweaking? That's what meth heads call the high. Didn't help his looks any. Meth rotted the teeth sucked up his cheeks and wilted the man's face like a baked apple. It took a little time, but my buddy managed to kick that nasty habit, only to fall hard into alcohol. When the IRS came calling a few months later and seized his family home for taxes, old Joe threw up his hands and hit rock bottom. Now he was living in a 15-foot travel trailer bought from a dude named Pooch that I'd parked under a tree at the far end of the chicken coop. When I returned to Via Vista from B Canyon, Joe heard my truck arrive and emerge from his trailer. I was in no mood to talk, so I went straight into the apartment, grabbed a glass, and poured myself a stiff jolt of turkey. My buddy knocked once and stepped through the door as I was pouring another. Where you been, he said in a lazy drawl. Had some business. That right? Something I should know about? Nothing that concerns you, I said. Joe fidgeted uncomfortably. Everything all right, George? Everything's fine, I said before draining the bourbon. He lingered a moment, then drifted back outside, quietly shutting the door behind him. I never kept secrets from Joe, and I hated to start now, but this was a big one, and I didn't want to open my mouth until I finalized things with Special Agent Carr. Besides, there was no telling how old Joe would react to the news. Yes, he saw the Vogels as a bunch of misbehaved children who needed a good belt whipping, but there was no love for the United States government either. Just a few years earlier, the IRS had snatched his family home and booted him into the street. Now here I was, sleeping with the enemy.